Good morning, CDPC Subang. Blessed New Year to you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. One, one, two, three. First of January, 2023. It is good to be here together as God's people. It is good. It is good. It is good to be here and because God is good. Can I just um, have us to recite together to read together the first seven verses of psalm 95 as we prepare our hearts to worship him this morning psalm 95 taken from the niv verses 1 to 7 shall we begin come let us sing for joy to the lord let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song for the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care brothers and sisters the people of his pasture the flock under his care what blessed assurance as we enter into this new year 2023 we are in his land and he remains sovereign and the almighty creator of the universe cares for us so this morning and every day after let us sing as children of the risen king. So, well, that's your clue, right? First song, come people of the risen king. Now, the last time I sang this song, we had some actions for the children. I don't know whether the bigger children remember it as well. Do you remember Rejoice? Can we show the chorus, please? Thank you, the chorus. All right, little kids, because you are still awake, I'm not so sure about your parents, so... <laughs> Little kids, if you remember, the big kids, if you remember as well, um, rejoice. Remember now, one, two, three. Rejoice, rejoice. I'm getting blank faces. Let every, oh, let every heart re, let, sorry, let, I'm the one who's blur, right? Let every tongue rejoice, one heart, one voice. Oh, 
church of Christ rejoice. Big keys, can you do it with me, please? <laughs> okay, we go. One, two, three. Rejoice, rejoice. Let every tongue rejoice. One heart, one voice. Oh, church of Christ rejoice. Remember why church? Church is the peop- is the people, not the building. So church, left, right. The people, the people whose hands, yeah, left, right, church of Christ, rejoice. Okay? Come, let us sing. Shall we rise? Breaking 
day. Oh, let them praise Him, praise His name. forward 2023 
our hearts rejoice at the works of your hands in the splendor of nature the miracle of life Lord we marvel at the daily miracle and blessing of knowing you and being known by you God through the life death and resurrection of your son Jesus Christ we are saved from our sin we have eternal hope we live an eternal life Lord let this be our daily prayer that we will boast of nothing but what Christ has done for us live from our place of rest in you. Jesus Christ. 
Father, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the universe. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So we bring our prayers before you, O oh, everlasting God. Father, we are entering another new year. 2022 was a tough year for many of us, Lord. Besides the obvious reasons of the pandemic um, many people struggled with various things some of us uh, lost our jobs others struggled with relationship with um, family and friends and some even lost their loved ones and many of us struggle financially especially in light of the depreciating uh, ringgit even churches were fractured and the body of Christ became superficial and we have to confess that many of us, we enjoyed not opening our lives to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And we somehow neglected the church and withdrew uh, to our comfort zones. Lord, in our struggles with the challenges and hardships in life, we neglected the broken around us. We failed to love our neighbors well and became self-centered in many ways. We became bitter with our leaders and grumbled more than praying for them. We sought our own comfort because of the tough year rather than going the extra mile uh, for the hurting. Some of us neglected our relationship with you, Lord. We somehow forgot that you are the one who turned human beings back to dust. 
and the one who holds time in his hands. We ended up living as though we are gods, despite the frailty of our lives. Father, many of us are carrying much of this weight on our shoulders as we enter this new year. We are bringing our pains, our sorrows, griefs, and of course our sins as well. And rightly so, because we are not robots and we can't just delete our memories or the desires of our hearts. And some of us, we are also bringing along the pain of losing loved ones, while for others, it is the pain of not having gained a loved one. And still for some, uh, the pain of not starting a, a family. So many dreams, wishes, hopes and prayers were not answered in 2022. And we are humbled by your plan. We do not understand your ways, but we trust that you are good because the Bible says so. So teach us, Lord, to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Father, our prayer is that you will reveal the desires of our hearts to each one of us. Because we have a deep tendency to achieve or somehow once again attain the dashed dreams and hopes of the past years and fashion them in the forms of New Year resolutions and goals and targets. And because uh, we know, Lord, how uh, deceitful our hearts are. And very often, though on the surface, some of these desires and resolutions may seem good, may seem harmless, it reveals the conditions of our hearts which desires more for comfort, for stability, for affirmation, for strength, for control and power. We desire just to be normal and fit into the molds that we, our families and our culture has set for us. So have mercy upon us, we pray. Have compassion on us, Lord, your people. We repent of our sins. Teach us to be satisfied in you alone. May the death and resurrection of Jesus be the anchor of our hopes in times of storms. May we grow this year to savor our relationship with you far above anything this world can offer to us, Lord. Lord, help us to know our place as your people placed in Malaysia for a time such as this. So we repent of our sins and we ask that you will help us to repent even more as you reveal what's deep within our hopes for this new year. Thus, we commit 2023 before you, lifting our hands and saying, God, we don't know what this year holds. All our dreams may be dashed once again in a matter of weeks, but we know that you are God. And in that, we take comfort, O sovereign God. So bring us back to you every time we tend to forget this and try to play God and orchestrate our own lives according to our own sinful desires. May you, O oh Lord, be our rock, be our shelter, be our pillar of strength and cloud of protection and shield during times of spiritual warfare. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. May your deeds, Lord, be shown to your servants and establish the works of our hands. Yes, establish the works of our hands. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. We'll read the catechism. So today we'll be starting with Westminster Shorter Catechism, question number one. So I'll read out the question um, and then we can answer together, right? So question number one, what is man's primary purpose. Together, man's primary purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Thank you. Good morning, church. Happy New Year, everyone. Hope you had a good uh, New Year celebration, and it's good to see everyone this morning. Uh, keep this on first. And just to wish you all a Happy New Year, and uh, Sunday being on the first day of the New Year. I um, want to warmly welcome those of you who are here for the first time, visiting with us. If you are here for the first time, 
with a little uh, souvenir for you. Can you just raise your hand so that we can welcome you uh, through our applause. Anyone here visiting with us? All right, welcome. I see. Anyone? I, please keep your hands. Oh, okay. Over there. <laughs> welcome. Welcome. Sir. Right, and if you are uh, on YouTube, well, um, you can reach out to us, uh, scan the QR code, or, or, or uh, let us know that you're there through uh, our WhatsApp number over there. Okay? So, uh, welcome. Right, we will have... Uh, no, I think kids talk first. Let's have a kids talk. So, uh, children, can you come forward? Is there any children around us today? <laughs> Ready, set, All right. go, go, go. Seeking you is the adventure of a lifetime You better than go, go, go And any other treasure Come on, children You are what you are Happy New Year! We want to know when ready to see you all here. Can we put up? Oh, I see. All right, children. Hello, Aliyah. Hi, Aliyah. You can sit on the chair here. And Eden. And. Hello. Hey, hi. Good to see everyone here this morning. Hello. Come, have a seat. Oh. They haven't been back for a while, so I'm glad to see them. Welcome. <laughs> Hi. All right. Can we just flash the uh, catechism real quick again before? So this morning, tell me, children, what is your favorite toy? Dad, you got your favorite toy, Aaliyah. What is that? What is it? A panda. Okay, anyone, what's your favorite toy? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> your dad doesn't buy you any toys? Okay, we'll need to have a chat. Okay, what's... I don't you don't know? I got one. What that? A magic wand. A magic wand and a panda. What, what's your favorite toy? A unicorn. Oh, wow. How about you, uh, uh, Eliza? What's your favorite toy? Okay, you're thinking. Eyes are up there. What? Why is your panda your favorite toy? Because why? All right. Okay. And why is the wand your favorite toy? It like the color. The color is beautiful. What color is it? Pink. Okay, okay, and, and, okay, so some of you said, what is your favorite toy? What is, who is your favorite person? Mommy! Mommy! Oh, who is your favorite person? Daddy, Aliyah says. Huh? My mom and dad. Your mom and your dad, okay. Who's your favorite person? Mommy. Mommy and daddy. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, why is your mommy and daddy your favorite person? He gives me a hug. He gives you a hug every all the, time. all the time. Praise the Lord. It's so nice, isn't it? It's and your daddy and mommy gives you a hug. That's why they love you. You feel that love, and you want to tell everyone about it. Okay, what? What? Why? Why is your daddy and mommy your favorite people? Just your favorite because you wake up and they're there. They're always there for you. Isn't that cool? You know, look over here, children. It says, what is the primary purpose for us? What is, it is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. To glorify God means to, to tell everyone how great this God is, how good this God is. How, why did you, do you love this God? What has He done for you? That's to... Make God a lot of things. And, that, and so when you come here as we worship, that's what we do. We tell everyone as we sing the praise, as we, tell, as we sing out the songs, we tell people about God's glory. 
God's splendor, God's love. What are some things about God that you know? What are some things about God that you know? He's what, Eliza? He's powerful, okay? He always loves us no matter what. That's good. And, and what else? Anything else? Anything? Yeah. He always forgives everyone. All right. Yeah, this is God. And so, and so when you, when, we, when we, um, we come to church, why do you come to church? So that you can worship. And what does that mean? To glorify God. To make God, you can turn that off. To make God wonderful and glorious. To tell everyone around you. When you go to school, to tell them about this God that you worship. And so we come here every Sunday to do that, to glorify God and to enjoy Him. Do you enjoy your parents? Yes. yes. Wow, that was quick. Do you enjoy your parents, spending time with your parents? You do, don't you? Because they love you. And so as we glorify God, we also enjoy Him. Yeah. Oh, you don't like it when your parents punish you? I know, that's hard, isn't it? But do you, why do they punish you? Why do they punish you? Oh, because you did something wrong. So that's, that's also love because they, are, they, they discipline you, right? And so then you won't do it again. So that's a, God, a way that we learn how to do it. Yeah. yeah. So that's the same with God. He sometimes disciplines us, but He never stops loving us. Amen? All right, let us pray. Our Father, we thank you that you have uh, allowed us the, the voice and the, and the ability to praise you and to glorify you. And Lord, we pray that as we come to church, as we go home, that we will learn to glorify you with our lips, with our mouth, with our hands, with our lives, that, that we will also enjoy you forever. And so we pray, Lord, for our dear children today. May they grow to know you as the God who loves them, as the God who's with them and for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, children. You may go back to your seats. Listen to the sermon if you can. We don't have any activity sheet today, but you can listen to the sermon. Okay? Bye-bye. Scripture. Scripture reading from the English Standard Version. Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 to 29. Now, on the first day of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Verse 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is the word of God. Amen. Thank you, Alicia. We are um, 
we are going uh, um, on a series uh, uh, this next four weeks on why we gather to worship. And I think it's good that we look at this um, over the next four weeks, in the first four weeks of the year, as to why we even come here, as to what, what happens on Sunday as we come to worship God, what we call the worship service. Uh, I think it'd be good for us to know. And so we are looking at the next four weeks. To Today, we're looking at the the Holy Communion, the sacraments, and what that means to us. Next week on why we sing, and then the week after on um, why we, um, why we um, pray, and then the week after why we have each other in fellowship. And these are the means of grace in which God has given us as children of God to enjoy and to worship Him and to glorify Him forever. So uh, we, look, we'll gather, we, we look at this as to why we gather to worship. Um, so today, uh, being the first week of the month, we will have, uh, have break bread and, and uh, come to the table together. Okay? So why then do we gather in worship? Um, Hebrews, uh, just turn to you very quickly to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Uh, but ch- Hebrews 10, it says that, um, talks about uh, our worship. Our worship and, and what it means today that the worship today is very different from the worship of the Old Testament when they had to go to the tabernacle, where they had to sacrifice. But uh, the writer of Hebrews says that uh, we don't have to do that anymore, not through sacrifices anyway, uh, because we, have, no, we no longer need, we know we have Christ who has uh, paid the penalty of our sins and became that sacrifice uh, because it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away our sins. And then in verse 25, of chapter 10, he then goes on to say, uh, let us now consider then how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. And so we are encouraged to come together, uh, to come together for what purpose? To spur one another on to love and good deeds. Now this word spur is the word to disturb. You know, when the horse has the spurs, the the rider would tap on the horse and that sharp edge at the back of the shoe will spur the horse and the horse would gallop faster. It's meant to disturb you. And so as we gather together, can you believe it? The person next to you is supposed to disturb you. Yeah, when you're falling asleep, maybe he can spur you. But here it says in verse, uh, verse 25, to stir you up, to stir one another to love and good works, to love and good works, not neglecting the meeting together as is the habit of some. I think even today, there is the habit of some to not come together, to to say, ah, I don't feel like coming this Sunday. I I had a late night. I uh, I was partying too hard last night because it was New Year's Eve. No, I don't come. um, And so I don't come. But then there's the the habit of of doing this. But it says we, we, we need to be there to spur one another. And then it says to encourage one another. So not only do we disturb one another, but we also encourage one another. We come alongside. And that is the reason we come together. Uh, we come together all the more as we see the day drawing. And why? Because our faith needs to be encouraged. Our spiritual faith and life needs to be encouraged by doing that. Right? And so... Um, why is it so important to clarify our understanding of why we gather to worship? Even today, as, we, as I uh, talk about this this morning, why is it so important? Because, you see, how we understand our gathering together, this gathering together, is going to determine how you worship and your priority you give to worship, right? So, for example, if you take this as just another town hall meeting, just coming together for fellowship, singing a few songs, listening to uh, somebody talk up here and then to pray and go home. If that's all you take it to be, then it would be very likely that if you don't feel like coming because you had a very tiring evening on Saturday night, then you won't come. Because all it is, it's just another meeting. Or if you take it to be a booster for the week ahead, then likely that to, to prepare you for the week ahead. You, you say, I need this booster to come on Sunday so that I can, 
I can go to work on Monday to Friday and be a good employee and work hard because I get this encouragement. I sing the songs that make me feel good. Then I go back to work. Then what's going to happen is that because you are in the center, you begin to, to find that the service is not good enough. Maybe it didn't give you a good enough boost. Maybe the sermon wasn't that boost, boosting or living, lifting of your spirits. And so you become the center of that worship service. As Reformed Christians, we see our worship as the, as the Lord's Day, which is set apart as holy for the worship of God. The Westminster Confession of Faith in, verse, in the chapter 21.5 outlines what we do in our worship service. This is what we do. It says, The reading of the Scriptures with godly fear, we saw that, the sound preaching, and the conscionable hearing of the Word in obedience unto God with understanding, faith, and reverence. So that's very important. First, up, up, up right, up, up front, is the Word of God. Read, preached, understood, taken in. Right? Singing of psalms with grace in the heart. That's what we got today. We sang. We sang truth to one another. As also the due administration and worthy receiving of the sacraments instituted by Christ are all parts of the ordinary religious worship of God. And that's what we're going to do today. The partaking of the sacraments instituted by Christ, which are the ordinary religious worship of God. God tells us how He is to be worshipped, even from the Old Testament. Do we just come and do what we like and you know, add this and add that? No, God has very set ways in which He is to be worshipped. In the book of Exodus, if you go back to Exodus 25 to 30, in which God gave instructions on the tabernacle, you would see that the, the instructions were very specific to the very nail, to the very pole of what it should be made of, what is the, the base of the pole to be made out of silver, the top to be made out of gold, what are the tents, what should be on the tents, what color are the tents, how is the tents to be divided, the, the outer courts, the holy place and the holy of holies. You see, God was very specific in how He was to be worshipped. In fact, throughout the Old Testament in Leviticus 10, 1-3, Nadab and Abihu made up a strange fire so that this fire could go up to worship God. They were struck dead. And if, if you read on, there's uh, King Uzziah who offered incense in uh, 2 Chronicles 26. And what happened? The in, they, he was inflicted with leprosy because it is only priests who were allowed to offer incense. Uzziah's wrong worship led to God's immediate judgment. Many other examples in the Old Testament but if even for us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, it says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, now that we're receiving this kingdom of God that is for you, that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Acceptably with reverence and awe. There is, so we see here that there is an acceptable way in which we worship and it has to be one that has, shows reverence and awe of God. Why? Because God is holy. God is awesome. I, I know we use the word awesome today like, hey, cool. But this awesome in the Bible is awesome where God would judge you and He can destroy you. This is the kind of awesome God. He judges and consumes evil. And so God, as we come, we, we acknowledge that we come in an acceptable way to worship God in reverence and in awe. And I'm going to try to unpack what that means as we come together to worship God on Sunday morning. In every religion, in every religion, whether it's Buddhism or Hinduism, or worship is the place where and time where devotees come to meet their God to meet their God. And it's always involving a time of cleaning, as in Islam, there's ebullition, cleaning, washing, offering, and sacrifice to the deity who is considered holy in every religion. In the Bible, no difference. We have seen Abraham and his encounter with Yahweh. We have seen Moses who came before the burning bush and God said, remove your sandals because the ground you are standing on 
is holy ground. And, and Paul, uh, Peter, at the, when he was confronted with Jesus and the miracle of the fish happened in front of him, what did he do? He fell on his knees and said, I'm a sinful person. Away from me. I, I, I cannot stand before you. You see, when we are face to face with a holy God, our hearts are moved to repentance. We, we are face to face with our mortality and our finality and finiteness. And, and Paul at the road of Damascus had a vision when he saw Jesus, a bright light. The reality is that when we enter into this corporate worship in a place and a time, we meet God. And what that means is that our hearts are changed and transformed. You cannot come here, sing praises, meet the holy God face to face and not be changed and transformed. You may not experience this as you go out today, but if you continue doing this for the next 52 weeks of the 2023, your heart will be changed and transformed. Because that is what the Word of God, the sacraments, the prayers, and the singing, and the fellowship is meant to do for us. In the Bible, the term for God's relationship with His worshippers, you and I, are call, is called a covenant. It's called a covenant that God made. A covenant is a relationship between two entities, two parties. We have seen it a lot in the Old Testament when a covenant was made with a, usually a stronger nation over a weaker nation. And that's what you call a suzerain king, a king that would make, come down to make a treaty or a covenant with a weaker nation, offering protection, offering uh, protection in return of allegiance, in return of taxes, in return of something else. That, that was a covenant that, was, that happened nationally. Similarly with God, He makes a covenant with His people. And that covenant, uh, that covenant is, uh, He enters into a covenant promising us, promising us salvation when by grace we call on Him in faith. When we come to Him in faith, we call on Jesus Christ, he comes to make this covenant uh, real to us. Meeting with God in worship, therefore, is to engage in this covenantal conversation with the great King. When you come here on Sunday, when you pray, when we sing, when we read the scripture together, we are in a covenantal reading and conversation with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the creator of the heavens and the earth. So can I say this, that our Sunday morning service is a covenant renewal ceremony between the great king and his subjects. That is how special this moment is, brothers and sisters. Not to be taken lightly, nor flippantly. And so as you read the Old Testament, what is truly astounding that, is that even though God's people continue to disobey Him and sin and rebel over and over again as the people of Israel did, consistently breaking covenant with God, you realize that God never cast them out. God never cast them out. Yes, because, because of their sin, they were kicked out of the covenant land. They were in exile in Babylon and in Egypt. But they were never never kicked out, out of relationship, out of a covenant relationship which God Himself made with His people. What we see is the God who comes to His sinful, disobedient people over and over again and renews His covenant relationship with His people. We first see in God's redemption of the people of Israel from the bonds of Pharaoh. He frees them in a dramatic scene. Right in Exodus, we saw that a couple of years ago, he tells the people to prepare a lamb without blemish and keep it for 14 days because he's going to do something to the land of Egypt. He's going to destroy all the firstborn. And he, but he told the people of Israel, I want you to take a lamb, keep it for 14 days, and then to, to um, season it with herbs and bitter herbs, unleavened bread, and then you are to come and eat of this lamb. You are to be fully dressed with belt fastened, sandals on your feet, staff in your hand, and you will eat it in haste. Because this very night, God says, I'm going to lead you out of Egypt, out of 
uh, out of the land that, that Pharaoh has uh, uh, enslaved you with. And he says, this is the Lord's Passover. The Lord himself will pass through the land of Egypt that night and strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, he says in Exodus 12. And then in Exodus 12, verse 22, note it says, God says this, None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning for the angel of the Lord will bring judgment. All, none of you shall go out of the door. Signifying that whether it is the Egyptians, whether it, you are Israelites, if you are outside of the door, you will be struck down. The firstborn will be struck down. Why is this? It's because it doesn't matter whether you are Egyptian or Israeli, Israelite, whether you are, whether you are uh, a, a, a person or whether you are an animal even, if you are not under that door, under that blood covering, you will be struck down. It is not my goodness, it is not my race or my nationality, it is only, solely, the blood of the Lamb that is over the doorpost. And then he says in Exodus 12, verse 14 and 17, that on the first day and seventh day of the week, gather as a holy assembly. No work shall be done in those days, and you shall observe the feast of the unleavened bread throughout your generations. You see, in other words, this story of God's redemption of his people out of Egypt is to be memorialized forever through a Passover ceremony which involves a meal and partaking of the unleavened bread. For generations, even up to today, the Israelites would, Israeli would celebrate the Passover at the same time we have our Good Friday and Easter. If God's initiation of providing the blood of the Lamb on every Israelite doorpost, of the covenantal conversation, uh, sorry, the cleansing and redemption of the people of Israel was crucial before any aspect of that covenantal conversation could ha happen. But once he had declared them right before him, he moved to the next phase of consecrating them. So he brought them out of Egypt. He brought them out of Egypt. He, he consecrated them, made them his people, and he is their God. And then now what did he do? He began to consecrate them by giving them his word. He moved to the next phase of consecrating them, gave them his word, which people could respond in faith and obedience so that they could respond. In Exodus 24, 3, it says, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And finally, the conclusion of this covenantal interchange between God and His people is sealed with a meal. In Exodus 24, uh, verse 9 and 11, interesting, as God made this covenant and gave them the Ten Commandments, Moses and uh, Aaron and Nadab and Abihu in Exodus 24 together with the 70 elders, what did they do? They went up to, the, to Mount Sinai, stood before God, and they, and they testified that under their feet was a paved work of sapphire stone, as, like as if they were in heaven. And then what did they do? They saw God, and they ate and drank. They had a meal with God in, in what was supposed to be a heavenly meal. You see, that is how God always affirms his covenant. It is true a meal. Isn't it true that the most intimate moments in a family, your most precious moments, is over a family meal? And that's why you have it in Chinese New Year, you have it in Thanksgiving dinners, you have it in your Christmas meal, where you come together to establish that bond once again, as it was in the Old Testament. This is always what a proper covenantal relationship is with God, and it always leads to communion with Him over a meal especially. What a blessing, what a joy, what a privilege it is for us. The people have been called by the Creator God of the universe, a personal, intimate, life-giving relationship with this God over a meal, over a meal. That was Exodus 24. And then what happened? Well, Moses went up again to receive the Ten Commandments. And then not long after that, in Exodus 32, 
the people made a golden calf and worshipped it. They rebelled against God. The question that I ask is this, why? Why does God not give up on His people? Why does God not give up on His people? Out of, the, you know, He gives them the covenant meal, He gives them, the, He consecrates them with the word, and then they go ahead and make a golden calf to worship. Why does not God not give up on you? Over and over again, when you come to confess your sin, you fall back into sin and rebellion, over sin, over our disobedience. Why does God continue to keep His end of the bargain even though we've failed time and time again? When we are caught in sin, when we lose our temper, when we are impatient, when we are not gracious to somebody else that we should be gracious to. Yet why does God continue to show His favour upon us, to invite us back for His covenantal meal and His covenantal conversation with us every Sunday morning? Why? Well, this answer is, what's the Sunday school answer? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. That's why. This, the sin of the Israelites, your sin, my consistent sinning, doesn't annul the covenant relationship we have with God because the plan was always for God to keep it. It was God who would keep this covenantal relationship. God continued to return to his disobedient children because he knew that the obedience that was required from Israel would one day be accomplished to perfection through his incarnated son, Jesus Christ. And that is our hope, brothers and sisters. That is why we sing. That is why we come. That is why we partake of this meal. Because even though we sin and disobey and fall over and over again, God never gives up on us. He never throws us out of His covenantal family. He always brings us back. Jesus Christ as our elder brother led the way to be our covenant keeper when we could not. You see, Christ is the Messiah, the appointed one who was to fulfill all that was required of Israel and all that was required of us. And that even as you and I fail to keep to this covenantal promise, over and over again, God keeps His end of the bargain. So why is it all important for us to get again? Why is all this important for us as we gather to worship every Sunday? Because the worship service is where God renews His covenant that we have broken just as He once did for ancient Israel. That is why we come. It is not to say that God's faithfulness to us uh, in Jesus Christ needs to be renewed like a like our handphone needs to be recharged. It's not to say that, but as we have done so much that would, it would warrant being rejected and cast out permanently by God for our benefit, God shows us through this worship service, through our worship, through our singing, that His faithfulness has never run out. That His faithfulness to us and His end of the bargain of keeping the covenant will never fail. While we are faithless, he remains faithful. In worship service, we revel in His unfailing commitment to us in and through His Son. We are cleansed not by anything our hands have done or our merits have earned, not by the sacrifices we offer, but only once and for all by the blood of Jesus Christ on our doorposts, on our life, sacrificed for us on the cross. We are consecrated to God's people by the preaching of His Word. When we hear the very words of God on Sunday, our hearts are transformed, changed through the work of the Holy Spirit. And so when we commune with God as we partake of the body and the blood of His Son, so not only are we, uh, are we consecrated, are we cleansed first and brought into His family, we are also consecrated. Not only are we consecrated, God will then lead us to have communion with Him. We commune with God. And this only makes sense if you, are, if you are in covenant relationship with God. He mysteriously explains this in John 6 when he says that He is the bread of life. At that time, no one knew what He was saying when Jesus said this. In John chapter 6, verse 22, He says in verse 
22 onwards, but in, let me read verse 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. He is the bread of life. And as we consume this, as we partake of this bread every first week of the month, we are declaring and remembering that this, for our spiritual health and well-being, that this is truly the bread of life that we partake and that we are renewed in this covenant and it becomes a life in us and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And so that is his, his promise to us that he would renew us, strengthen our faith every time we partake of the bread together. Jesus is saying here that in giving his life as a ransom for us, he's fulfilling the covenant that God made for his people. He's the bread of life and as we consume, commune with God, we eat this bread and drink this blood as a clear sign to us of his covenant promise that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Isn't this a wonderful thing to hear on New Year's Day? That this is the God that we love and serve. That even though we fail, He will never leave us nor forsake us. Finally, after having cleansed us, having consecrated us, allowing us to commune with Him, He commissions us to love one another and to proclaim this good news to all people. Jesus, in our passage, that was my introduction, no, I'm joking. In, our, in, in Matthew chapter 26, in our text this morning, Matthew 26, verse 40, Jesus says, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. And as he comes, Jesus, even today, in cleansing and consecrating us, allow us to commune with him through the partaking of the bread and the cup. See, this Passover meal, which the people of Israel performs, generation after generation, is fulfilled and com fulfilled completely in Jesus Christ. He is the bread of life. And partaking of it today says that we affirm that we are His covenant children with whom He has redeemed. Coming together in our worship service and partaking of the bread and the cup is a covenant renewal ceremony. Not to be taken lightly, but yet God invites us welcomingly, openly, to come and partake of the bread and the cup because this is my, my body and my blood. Jesus truly stands at the center of this covenantal conversation of worship. He is the ultimate meeting point between heaven and earth. It is all about Him, and right here in this place, in this room, as we worship, as we partake of the covenant meal together, Jesus Christ is right here in our midst. We rehearse again and again each week the covenant faithfulness of God to us in His Son. We rehearse the gospel which teaches us that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ Himself. And so in, in Matthew 26, as, as uh, it was read today, the institution of the Lord's Supper, how then do we respond as we come together, as we partake of this meal together? How should our hearts be? And I just want to remind us and bring us to that uh, where is it? Matthew 27, right? Sorry, 20. I can't find it. Okay, 26, verse 26. Uh, 26, 26. Um, and he says this, that... Uh, uh, on the first day of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare to eat this Passover? Jesus Christ is looking forward to eating this Passover with his disciples because it's a, it's a Passover meal. It's a Passover meal. And so as they come together, they look back. He said, go into the city to, to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time's at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. Jesus longs to to continue this, this tradition, this custom of having his Passover with his disciples so that they can look back and see God's redemption and understand God's redemption for man and for Israel. And as you partake of this, this is my redemption for you. And then verse 29, 
as he, uh, Jesus says in verse 26, now as we are eating, Jesus took bread, and after having broken it, gave it to the disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body, and he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in the Father's kingdom. There is, a, in, in our communion, there's an element of looking back at the cross of what Jesus had done for us, His redemption for us. This Passover meal, which now is a pointing to Christ, His redemption over us. But there is also an element of looking forward, it says, that Jesus will not partake of this cup until He does so at the final feast in heaven with us. That's His promise. Now, I find it really interesting because if, if you go and look at some Jewish uh, custom, right? If you look at some rabbis writing, there are four cups, four wine cups at a Passover meal, at the cedar meal. And I believe that Jesus had drank his first two and then his third was this one that was recorded. Why do I say that? Because if you read a rabbi, any of the rabbis, they, they don't understand really why this tradition of four wine cups have been brought forth. But there, there have been rabbis of old who have written that these four cups are meant to represent the four sayings of, Jesus, of God to, in the word, in the Torah, which is one, I shall take you out, I shall rescue you, I shall redeem you, and the fourth, I shall bring you. And, and they would, every time they would partake of this first cup, they would say, I shall take you out, meaning I will take you out of Egypt. I shall rescue you, meaning I will bring you out, cross the, cross the river, and uh, your pursuers will not get you. I will rescue you, and then I shall redeem you, and finally, I shall bring you to, you, to the promised land. And I believe that this is very significant, that Jesus, as he says this, has, does this third cup because he has done this. I shall take you out. I shall rescue you. I shall redeem you. And the fourth cup, what Jesus is saying is, I shall bring you home. I shall bring you home. And that last cup will only be fulfilled when he does this in the last days, in the, in the feast of the Lamb, when he will partake of this last cup with you and I at the very end. Isn't this wonderful that God has instituted this for us today? So the first is we look back at what God has done. We look forward. We look forward at what God has promised us. But not only that, brothers and sisters, we also look around. And uh, we also look around, and, and I want to just ask, have us look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 15 uh, and 17. And verse 16, it says this, that um, for, though we, for, though, for we, though many, are one body, for we all partake of that one bread. And, and Paul, as he wrote to the Corinthians, Corinth, Church of Corinth, as they were partaking of this um, bread unworthily in a, in a wrong manner. But yet, G, uh, Paul tells them this, that um, uh, the cup of the blessing that we bless, is, it is not participation in the blood of Christ. The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. And we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. You see, in the supper, in this body of Christ. We are drawn in more deeply to Christ. We are reminded that our union to Him is the deepest expression of His love for us. A love that would move Christ to give all the, to all the faithful His own self for heavenly food that God has given us. We are united with Him. And so as we are united with Him, we are also united to one another. And together, as we eat from the same bread, we show ourselves to be united to one another. As the Lord's Supper brings us to Christ, it also brings us to one another. We are united as one family, one body, 
the supper presents for us a visible demonstration of an invisible reality. That the Holy Spirit is at work within all of us, within you and me, bringing us together into deeper conformity and in deeper community for Christ. So you see, this bread and cup that we take has significant meaning and does a work in our hearts. It transforms and changes us as we do this week in, week out, month in, month out. It is not a worship to be taken flippantly, but with deep understanding of the covenant God made with us and how by participating in the communion meal, He is renewing His commitment to you and I, to His redeemed people. That as we remember the cross, we become thankful for His cross, the cross that He had died for us. We look forward to His coming again when we shall partake of the meal once again with all the saints together in glory. And then finally, we shall commune together, partaking of that same table, acknowledging our oneness with each other as, as children of God. That is why we cannot partake of this unworthily if we have a, uh, a something against another brother. And so, shall we not come every Sunday to prepare our hearts for meeting God in this covenant renewal ceremony? It's, not a pri it's a privilege. It's not an act of service. Okay, I know for those who are serving, you think, well, I come on my duty, I'm serving. You, you don't come here to serve God. You come here to worship the living God. Yes, we serve one another, but we worship God. It's worship, not an act of duty. So may I encourage those of you who are serving on Sunday to stop this practice of coming only when you're on duty. It makes too much of your offering and too little of God. Because what you're saying is I can only come to worship my Savior and to renew my covenant only when I'm on duty. That doesn't honour God at all. Because what we come here together is to honour the God who has made covenant with us. May I also encourage you to come at least five minutes before 11 a.m., if not longer, to prepare your hearts for this covenant renewal ceremony and to go to any brother or sister to which you are withholding love because of some conflict and say, I love you because Christ loves me and has shown me grace. Can we do that for the next 52 weeks? Then watch the Lord begin to do something amazing in our lives and in our community as we come each Sunday to worship Him, to partake of this covenant renewal meal in His presence. On the first week of the month when we get to eat the bread of life in the presence of our Christ and the blood of the new covenant shed for me for the forgiveness of sins. Let us prepare our hearts this morning as we come together as one body in Christ to participate of this meal. Can I ask the elders and deacons to come and help? As the elements are going down, please hold them in your hands so that we can partake of it together as one body. Um, and for now, just uh, look to God and thank Him as you remember the cross and what He has done for you on the cross.
Anyone who has been left out that haven't received the cup or the bread, please put up your hands. We partake together as a sign of con unconditional and selfless love that has been poured into our hearts by Christ and now pours forth into each other's lives. In the supper, we learn that we cannot love Christ without loving Him in the brethren. And so as we come together, God welcomes all of us to partake of the bread and the cup, His me co covenant meal together. But there is a way of partaking of this in an unworthy manner. And if you come from another church that, is, uh, that has been, uh, that you're under discipline, we ask that you refrain. If, uh, or if you have unforgiveness with another brother or sister, that you refrain from participating. Shall we rise and let's partake of this together? On the night in which she was betrayed, Jesus took bread and having broken it, gave to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. As often as you partake of it, remember me. Let's partake of the bread together. In the same manner, he took the cup and said, This is the blood, my blood poured out for you for the remission of sins. This is the new covenant which is poured out for you for the remission of sins. Every time you drink of it, remember me. Let's partake of the cup together. <clears throat> Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have provided for us a way to come into your very presence, holy and blameless with great joy. And we pray now, we thank you as we come to meet you and to covenant with you And this first day of the year. We know, Lord, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. That no matter what the year holds for us, we know that as long as we kept this body of Christ, this community in which you have given us, in which we shall come every Sunday to covenant together with you, in this renewal ceremony, as we worship you, as we sing praises, as we pray, as we partake of this covenant meal together, we will always remain in your covenant, that you are faithful to keep this for us. And so we pray that you would send us forth to do your work and to do your will for your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. You may be seated. We collect the cups. Collect them. Thanks. Let me just uh, bring you the announcements. A um, few quick announcements here. 
All right, next slide. All right, Sunday live stream. Um, we want to encourage people to come. We want to encourage those of you on live stream also to, to go to a church, right? Um, to be a part of a community in a church. This watching, community, watching service online is not being part of a community. Nevertheless, we understand that there are some of you who, uh, because you are uh, elderly, you are struggling, you may not um, be able to make it here. You are in your home and you have no other reason choice. You can't drive, you can't walk. Um, then we want to extend this to you. So it is, uh, come upon request, write, uh, WhatsApp us, the link, we will send you the link so that you can follow along uh, our service, okay? Um, and then we will also post uh, the service during the week, but not on Sunday morning, all right? Next. Um, well, we're going to have a Gotong Royong. Um, Chinese year is coming up, right? You clean up your house. Well, we're going to try to clean up uh, this house uh, as we come together on the 14th of January on Saturday, uh, between 9 to 2. More than just cleaning, uh, we hope that you can, we all can come of different generations, of different uh, ages to come together to fellowship, to get to know one another, and also to clean the church premise, right? And so... Um, if you can RSVP on the Subang News WhatsApp group or on the notice board that you're coming, that would be good so that we know how many hands we have. We can uh, assign you to the different jobs, also mix you up so that you can get to know one another um, across, cell, across care groups, okay? So that's a, a, a wonderful time of community service together uh, to serve one another. Our library, there's uh, 15th of January and 29th of January that the the library will open 30 minutes before and after service. So this is just for you by way of knowing that we have a library at the back. Not only that, but uh, you can you go to it 30 minutes before and after or after the service, okay? Uh, only on the 15th and 29th of January. I think the last two weeks of the month, perhaps. But yeah. uh, You can continue to be faithful in your cash, uh, your tithing. Uh, you can put your, drop your cash off at the box at the back uh, or do an online uh, banking, all right? Faithful to your cash. No, no, no. Faithful to God. <laughs> what, is, what, is, what is sermon? That's a sermon for another time. Shall we rise and sing the closing song? And shall we proclaim that there is only one gospel where hope is found? <clears throat> Through this one gospel, the church is one.
Christ. Amen. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week ahead. See you next week.